A quiet mind is all you need. I'm not well. I feel rather weak. What am I to do? Who is unwell? You're the body. My body, of course. Yesterday you felt well. What felt well? The body. You are glad when the body was well, and you are sad when the body is unwell. Who is glad one day, and sad the next? The mind. And who knows the variable mind? The mind. The mind is the knower. Who knows the knower? Does not the knower know itself? The mind is discontinuous. Again and again it blanks out. Like in sleep or swoon or distraction, there must be something continuous to register discontinuity. The mind remembers. This stands for continuity. Memory is always partial, unreliable, and evanescent. It does not explain the strong sense of identity pervading consciousness. The sense, I am. Find out what is at the root of it. However deeply I look, I find only the mind. Your words beyond the mind give me no clue. While looking with the mind, you cannot go beyond it. To go beyond, you must look away from the mind and its contents. In what direction am I to look? All directions are within the mind. I'm not asking you to look in any particular direction. Just look away from all that happens in your mind and bring it to the feeling I am. The I am is not a direction. It is the negation of all direction. Ultimately, even the I am will have to go. For you need not keep asserting what is obvious. Bringing the mind to the feeling I am merely helps in turning the mind away from everything else. Where does it all lead me? When the mind is kept away from its preoccupations, it becomes quiet. If you do not disturb this quiet and stay in it, you find that it is permeated with a light and a love you have never known, and yet you recognize it at once as your own nature. Once you have passed through this experience, you will never be the same man again. The unruly mind may break its peace and obliterate its vision, but it is bound to return, provided the effort is sustained, until the day when all bonds are broken, delusions and attachments end, and life becomes supremely concentrated in the present. What difference does it make? The mind is no more. There is only love and action. How shall I recognize this state when I reach it? There will be no fear. Surrounded by a world full of mysteries and dangers, how can I remain not afraid? Your own little body, too, is full of mysteries and dangers, yet you are not afraid of it, for you take it as your own. What you do not know is that the entire universe is your body, and you need not be afraid of it. You may say you have two bodies, the personal and the universal. The personal comes and goes. The universal is always with you. The entire creation is your universal body. You are so blinded by what is personal that you do not see the universal. This blindness will not end by itself. It must be undone skillfully and deliberately. When all illusions are understood and abandoned, you reach the air free and perfect state in which all distinctions between the personal and the universal are no more. I am a person and therefore limited in space and time. I occupy little space and last but a few moments. I cannot even conceive myself to be eternal and all-pervading. Nevertheless, you are, as you dive deep into yourself in search of your true nature. You will discover that only your body is small and only your memory is short, while the vast ocean of life is yours. The words I and universal are contradictory. One excludes the other. They don't. The sense of identity pervades the universal. Search and you shall discover the universal person, who is yourself and infinitely more. Anyhow, begin by realizing that the world is in you not you, in the world. How can it be? I am only a part of the world. How can the whole world be contained in the part except by reflection, mere like? 
What you say is true. Your personal body is a part in which the whole is wonderfully reflected. But you have also a universal body. You cannot even say that you do not know it because you see and experience it all the time. Only you call it the world and are afraid of it. I feel I know my little body, while the other I do not know except through science. Your little body is full of mysteries and wonders which you do not know. There also science is your only guide. Both anatomy and astronomy describe you. Even if I accept your doctrine of the universal body as a working theory, in what way can I test it and of what use is it to me? Knowing yourself as the dweller in both the bodies, you will disown nothing. All the universe will be your concern. Every living thing you will love and help most tenderly and wisely. There will be no clash of interest between you and others. All exploitation will cease, absolutely. Your every action will be beneficial. Every movement will be a blessing. It is all very tempting, but how am I to proceed to realize my universal being? You have two ways. You can give your heart and mind to self-discovery, or you accept my words on trust and act accordingly. In other words, either you become totally self-concerned or totally un-self-concerned. It is the word totally that is important. You must be extreme to reach the supreme. How can I aspire to such heights, small and limited as I am? Realize yourself as the ocean of consciousness in which all happens. This is not difficult. A little of attentiveness, of close observation of oneself, and you will see that no event is outside your consciousness. The world is full of events which do not appear in my consciousness. Even your body is full of events which do not appear in your consciousness. This does not prevent you from claiming your body to be your own. You know the world exactly as you know your body, through your senses. It is your mind that has separated the world outside your skin from the world inside and put them in opposition. This created fear and hatred and all the miseries of living. What I do not follow is what you are saying about going beyond consciousness. I understand the words, but I cannot visualize the experience. After all, you yourself have said that all experience is in consciousness. You are right. There can be no experience beyond consciousness. Yet there is the experience of just being. There is a state beyond consciousness which is not unconscious. Some call it superconsciousness or pure consciousness or supreme consciousness. It is pure awareness, free from the subject-object nexus. I have studied theosophy, and I find nothing familiar in what you say. I admit theosophy deals with manifestation only. It describes the universe and its inhabitants in great details. It emits many levels of matter and corresponding levels of experience, but it does not seem to go beyond. What you say goes beyond all experience. If it is not experienceable, why at all talk about it? My consciousness is intermittent full of gaps, yet there is the continuity of identity. What is this sense of identity due to, if not to something beyond consciousness? If I am beyond the mind, how can I change myself? Where is the need of changing anything? The mind is changing anyhow all the time. Look at your mind, dispassionately. This is enough to calm it. When it is quiet, you can go beyond it. Do not keep it busy all the time. Stop it and just be. If you give it rest, it will settle down and recover its purity and strength. Constant thinking makes it decay. If my true being is always with me, how is it that I am ignorant of it? Because it is very subtle, and your mind is gross, full of gross thoughts and feelings. Calm and clarify your mind, and you will know yourself as you are. Do I need the mind to know myself? You are beyond the mind, but you know with your mind. It is obvious that the extent, depth, and character of knowledge depend on what instrument you use. Improve your instrument, and your knowledge will improve.
to know perfectly I need a perfect mind. A quiet mind is all you need. All else will happen rightly once your mind is quiet. As the sun on rising makes the world active, so does self-awareness affect changes in the mind. In the light of calm and steady self-awareness, inner energies wake up and work miracles without any effort on your part. You mean to say that the greatest work is done by not working? Exactly. Do you understand that you are destined for enlightenment? Cooperate with your destiny. Don't go against it. Don't thwart it. Allow it to fulfill itself. All you have to do is to give attention to the obstacles created by the foolish mind. All search for happiness is misery. I come from England, and I'm on my way to Madras. There I shall meet my father, and we shall go by car overland to London. I am to study psychology, but I do not yet know what I shall do when I get my degree. I may try industrial psychology or psychotherapy. My father is a general physician. I may follow the same line. But this does not exhaust my interest. There are certain questions which do not change with time. I understand you have some answers to such questions, and this made me come to see you. I wonder whether I am the right man to answer your questions. I know little about things and people, and that much you also know. We are equals. Of course, I know that I am, but I do not know what it means. What you take to be the I in the I am is not you. To know that you are is natural. To know that you are is the result of much investigation. You will have to explore the entire field of consciousness and go beyond it. For this, you must find the right teacher and create the conditions needed for discovery. Generally speaking, there are two ways, external and internal. Either you live with somebody who knows the truth and submit yourself entirely to his guiding and molding influence, or you seek the inner guide and follow the inner light wherever it takes you. In both cases, your personal desires and fears must be disregarded. You learn either by proximity or by investigation, the passive or the active way. You either let yourself be carried by the river of life and love represented by your guru, or you make your own efforts guided by your inner star. In both cases, you must move on. You must be earnest. Rare are the people who are lucky to find somebody worthy of trust and love. Most of them must take the hard way, the way of intelligence and understanding, of discrimination and detachment. Viveka Varagya. This is the way open to all. I'm lucky to have come here, though I'm leaving tomorrow. One talk with you may affect my entire life. Yes, once you say, I want to find truth, all your life will be deeply affected by it. All your mental and physical habits, feelings and emotions, desires and fears, plans and decisions will undergo a most radical transformation. Once I have made up my mind to find the reality, what do I do next? It depends on your temperament. If you are earnest, whatever you choose will take you to your goal. It is the earnestness that is the decisive factorness. What is the source of earnestness? It is a homing instinct which makes the bird return to its nest and the fish to the mountain stream where it was born. The seed returns to the earth when the fruit is ripe. Ripeness is all. And what will ripen me? Do I need experience? You already have all the experience you need, otherwise you would not have come here. You need not gather any more. Rather, you must go beyond experience. Whatever effort you make, whatever method, sadhana you follow, will merely generate more experience, but will not take you beyond. Nor will reading books help you. They will enrich your mind, but the person you are will remain intact. If you expect benefits from your search, material, mental, or spiritual, you have missed the point. Truth gives no advantage. It gives you no higher status, no power over others. All you get is truth and the freedom from the faults. Surely truth gives you the power to help others. This is mere imagination, however noble. In truth, you do not help others because there are no others. 
You divide people into noble and ignoble, and you ask the noble to help the ignoble. You separate, you evaluate, you judge and condemn. In the name of truth, you destroy it. Your very desire to formulate truth denies it, because it cannot be contained in words. Truth can be expressed only by the denial of the false in action. For this you must see the false as false, viveka, and reject it, vairagya. Renunciation of the false is liberating and energizing. It lays open the road to perfection. When do I know that I have discovered it? When the idea this is truth, that is truth, does not arise. Truth does not assert itself. It is in the seeing of the false as false and rejecting it. It is useless to search for truth. When the mind is blind to the false, it must be purged of the false completely before truth can dawn on it. But what is false? Surely what has no being is false. What do you mean by having no being? The false is there hard as a nail. What contradicts itself has no being? Or it has only momentary being, which comes to the same. For what has a beginning and an end has no middle. It is hollow. It has only the name and shape given to it by the mind, but it has neither substance nor essence. If all that passes has no being, then the universe has no being either. Whoever denies it, of course the universe has no being. What has? That which does not depend for its existence, which does not arise with the universe arising, nor set with the universe setting, which does not need any proof, but imparts reality to all it touches. It is the nature of the false that it appears real for a moment. One could say that the true becomes the father of the false, but the false is limited in time and space and is produced by circumstances. How am I to get rid of the false and secure the real? To what purpose? In order to live better, a more satisfactory life, integrated and happy. Whatever is conceived by the mind must be false, for it is bound to be relative and limited. Real is inconceivable and cannot be harnessed to purpose. It must be wanted for its own sake. How can I want the inconceivable? What else is there worth wanting? Granted, the real cannot be wanted as a thing is wanted, but you can see the unreal as unreal and discarded. It is the discarding the false that opens the way to the true. I understand, but how does it look in actual daily life? Self-interest and self-concern are the focal points of the false. Your daily life vibrates between desire and fear. Watch it intently, and you will see how the mind assumes innumerable names and shapes like a river foaming between the boulders. Trace every action to its selfish motive, and look at the motive intently till it dissolves. To live one must look after oneself, one must earn money for oneself. You need not earn for yourself, but you may have to for a woman and a child. You may have to keep on working for the sake of others. Even just to keep alive can be a sacrifice. There is no need whatsoever to be selfish. Discard every self-seeking motive as soon as it is seen, and you need not search for truth. Truth will find you. There is a minimum of needs. Were they not supplied since you were conceived? Give up the bondage of self-concern and be what you are, intelligence and love in action. But one must survive. You can't help surviving. The real you is timeless and beyond birth and death, and the body will survive as long as it is needed. It is not important that it should live long. A full life is better than a long life. What is to say what is a full life? It depends on my cultural background. If you seek reality, you must set yourself free of all backgrounds, of all cultures, of all patterns of thinking and feeling. Even the idea of being man or woman or even human should be discarded. The ocean of life contains all, not only humans. So, first of all, abandon all self-identification. Stop thinking of yourself as such and such and so and so this or that. Abandon all self-concern. 
Worry not about your welfare, material or spiritual. Abandon every desire, gross or subtle. Stop thinking of achievement of any kind. You are complete here and now. You need absolutely nothing. It does not mean that you must be brainless and foolhardy, improvident or indifferent. Only the basic anxiety for oneself must go. You need some food, clothing and shelter for you and yours, but this will not create problems, as long as greed is not taken for a need. Live in tune with things as they are, and not as they are imagined. What if I am not human? That which makes you think that you are human is not human. It is but a dimensionless point of consciousness, a conscious nothing. All you can say about yourself is, I am. You are pure being, awareness, bliss. To realize that is the end of all seeking. You come to it when you seek all you think yourself to be as mere imagination and stand aloof in pure awareness of the transient as transient. Imaginary as imaginary, unreal as unreal. It is not at all difficult, but detachment is needed. It is the clinging to the faults that makes the truth so difficult to see. Once you understand that the false needs time, and what needs time is false, you are near the reality, which is timeless, ever in the now. Eternity in time is mere repetitiveness, like the movement of a clock. It flows from the past into the future endlessly, an empty perpetuity. Reality is what makes the present so vital, so different from the past and future which are merely mental. If you need time to achieve something, it must be false. The real is always with you. You need not wait to be what you are. Only you must not allow your mind to go out of yourself in search. When you want something, ask yourself, Do I really need it? And if the answer is no, then just drop it. Must I not be happy? I may not need a thing, yet if it can make me happy, should I not grasp it? Nothing can make you happier than you are. All search for happiness is misery and leads to more misery. The only happiness worth the name is the natural happiness of conscious being. Don't I need a lot of experience before I can reach such a high level of awareness? Experience leaves only memories behind and adds to the burden which is heavy enough. You need no more experience. The past ones are sufficient, and if you feel you need more, look into the hearts of people around you. You will find a variety of experiences which you would not be able to go through in a thousand years. Learn from the sorrows of others, and save yourself your own. It is not experience that you need, but the freedom from all experience. Don't be greedy for experience. You need none. Don't you pass through experiences yourself? Things happen around me, but I take no part in them. An event becomes an experience only when I am emotionally involved. I am in a state which is complete, which seeks not to improve on itself. Of what use is experience to me? One needs knowledge, education. To deal with things, knowledge of things is needed. To deal with people, you need insight, sympathy. To deal with yourself, you need nothing. Be what you are. Conscious being and don't stray from yourself. University education is most useful. No doubt it helps you to earn a living, but it does not teach you how to live. You are a student of psychology. It may help you in certain situations, but can you live by psychology? Life is worthy of the name only when it reflects reality in action. No university will teach you how to live so that when the time of dying comes you can say, I lived well, I do not need to live again. Most of us die, wishing we could live again. So many mistakes committed, so much left undone. Most of the people vegetate but do not live. They merely gather experience and enrich their memory. But experience is the denial of reality, which is neither sensory nor conceptual, neither of the body nor of the mind, though it includes and transcends both. But experience is most useful. By experience you learn not to touch a flame. 
I have told you already that knowledge is most useful in dealing with things, but it does not tell you how to deal with people and yourself, how to live a life. We are not talking about driving a car or earning money. For this you need experience, but for being a light unto yourself, material knowledge will not help you. You need something much more intimate and deeper than immediate knowledge, to be yourself in the true sense of the word. Your outer life is unimportant. You can become a night watchman and live happily. It is what you are inwardly that matters. Your inner peace and joy you have to earn. It is much more difficult than earning money. No university can teach you to be yourself. The only way to learn is by practice. Right away begin to be yourself. Discard all you are not and go ever deeper. Just as a man digging a well discards what is not water until he reaches the water-bearing strata, so must you discard what is not your own till nothing is left which you can disown. You will find that what is left is nothing which the mind can hook onto. You are not even a human being. You just are a point of awareness, coextensive with time and space and beyond both, the ultimate cause itself uncaused. If you ask me, who are you? My answer would be nothing in particular, yet I am. If you are nothing in particular, then you must be the universal. What is it to be universal? Not as a concept, but as a way of life. Not to separate, not to oppose, but to understand and love whatever contacts you is living universally. To be able to say truly, I am the world, the world is me. I am at home in the world, the world is my own. Every existence is my existence. Every consciousness is my consciousness. Every sorrow is my sorrow and every joy is my joy. This is universal life. Yet my real being and yours too is beyond the universe and therefore beyond the categories of the particular and the universal. It is what is totally self-contained and independent. I find it hard to understand. You must give yourself time to brood over these things. The old grooves must be erased in your brain without forming new ones. You must realize yourself as the immovable, behind and beyond the movable, the silent witness of all that happens. Does it mean that I must give up all idea of an active life? Not at all. There will be marriage, there will be children, there will be earning money to maintain a family. All this will happen in the natural course of events, for destiny must fulfill itself. You will go through it without resistance, facing tasks as they come, attentive and thorough, both in small things and big. But the general attitude will be of affectionate detachment, enormous goodwill, without expectation of return, constant giving without asking. In marriage, you are neither the husband nor the wife. You are the love between the two. You are the clarity and kindness that makes everything orderly and happy. It may seem vague to you, but if you think little, you will find that the mystical is most practical, for it makes your life creatively happy. Your consciousness is raised to a higher dimension, from which you can see everything much clearer and with great intensity. You realize that the person you became at birth and will cease to be at death is temporary and false. You are not the sensual, emotional, and intellectual person gripped by desires and fears. Find out your real being. What am I? Is the fundamental question of all philosophy and psychology. Go into it deeply.